basically the, the report's laid out in terms of classification of potholes. And in order to classify potholes, you have to understand pavement structures. So we touch on those areas. Also, the, the causes of potholes are outlined, trying to give the layperson a bit of an understanding of how potholes develop, why they develop, and then the mechanisms by which they develop and progress, and also how you do deal with repairing them. We cover off prevention of potholes, repair methods, the various materials that are available, touch on a number of different pieces of equipment, proprietary type equipment, things like that, as well as going through an area of best practices. So why was this project needed? The first one we put up there was the Ministry of Highways and Infrastructure diminished role. And that may not seem obvious, but for the past number of years, highways and government in general has stepped back. So up until that point, most of the specifications, most of the material specifications and so on that people referenced, they maybe developed their own, but they were prepared by government. And the government sponsored a lot of research, both internally and at the universities. So there was a huge source of information that people could rely on. That's no longer available. The infrastructure is aging, so obviously you're getting more failures in it. There's staff turnover, so there's not that wealth of knowledge that you can go back and ask people what happened before, has this material been tried, all those type of things. Economic growth, there's just so much more demand on the infrastructure, bigger loads, different types of loads. And then there's the abundance of commercial advice that's proprietary information, and they not necessarily have all of the information to answer your questions. So you need a, a network where you can go to other people and find out, has somebody else tried this? Has it worked? Have you had problems? Uh, all those type of issues. So what's included? We narrowed the scope to cover asphalt pavements and thin membrane surfaces, which are your cold mixes, seals, things like that, but we did not cover concrete pavements. So what's also included? We did a step-by-step -step review of all of the issues that I covered in the introduction but we didn't go into a lot of detail. We looked at all the tests that are required for the various materials, all those type of things, and we listed it, but again, we didn't go into a, a lot of detail on those items. The reports were meant to be kept at a fairly non-technical type level, so we tried to write them in such a way that anybody could pick them up and understand it. What we did do is include all of the references as a CD in the back so that if somebody wanted to go back in and find out more information on any of the products or processes, they could then have that reference readily available. So today's presentation is, a, again, a non-technical type presentation, which sometimes is difficult when you're a technical person to try not to get too technical and an overall strategy of dealing with potholes. So basically when you're looking at uh, potholes or how to manage them, how to repair them, you need a system to identify them. So we broke it down just in general terms in terms of the size of them and the pavement structure that they occurred in. And in terms of the structural, it's whether it's a structural failure where it's part of the whole subgrade is failing or whether it's just a surface failure and something that's only impacting the surface of the road and doesn't go deeper. So the root cause of potholes. 
moisture. That's, we deal a lot with the different types of moisture damage and so on, and I'll touch on it a bit later, and traffic loading. And when potholes show up, a lot of them may be on residential streets and so on, and people say, well, there's no big trucks there. Typically, the loading from buses, garbage trucks, school buses, a lot of them are overloaded on front axles, things like that. That's all it takes is one load at the wrong time over a weak spot to create that potable. And so it's understanding things like that is important in dealing with them. And then we do talk about the mechanism of failures, how a pothole develops, and trying to explain it in terms that somebody that doesn't know how pavements are designed and so on would understand it. So the basic mechanism is somehow you get water into the structure. It can either come in from the top, can come in from the sides, or it can be drawn up from below by frost. That water is concentrated, again, either by ponding on a lower level or being concentrated by frost lenses. It weakens the layer, a heavy load goes over it, and basically fractures your pavement surface, resulting in your failure. And if every spring there's usually a definition on the radio, somebody will ask CBC or whoever to explain how potholes develop. And over the years, I've done it a couple of times. I know when I was with highways, had to try and explain so the general public would understand potholes. And the range of explanation varies from year to year. It's interesting to always listen to the one the next year to see how they explain it. But so the, the opinions and the processes change, but water is usually the, the cause, and it's that loss of strength of the material due to the presence of water. So the key is prevention, if you can. And so sound planning and design of your pavements, your road systems, all the required drainage, all of those things our consideration in present, preventing pothole development. Even when you're designing rehabs or upgrades to your system, you can look at what are the potential causes of potholes, what have you had for performance, and what can you do to maybe reduce that risk of them developing again. Early identification, knowing where potholes potentially will develop, and maybe doing some preventative maintenance in advance. It's a lot of cases easier than waiting till they develop and then trying to fix them. And typically it's in a better time of the year that you can do that preventative work rather than being out there when it's 20 below and snow on the ground. We spend a fair bit of time in the report talking about the patching methods. And there are a number of different patching methods. What we did was we tried to talk to the sponsors and the other jurisdictions around the province, find out what equipment was used, make sure that we were dealing with the local type situation. As well, we went to the literature and looked around the world in countries that had similar climates to Canada to just see if there was anything different people were using there. And that was the same for the, the methods, the material, and the equipment. And so hot patching is typically a, the best approach. Usually you don't have that opportunity in the wintertime to use it. So other methods come into it. And then you get into the question of whether it's a temporary repair or a permanent repair, and we deal with how you deal the two separate, what are the processes, and so on. When we get into the area of materials, as I said, we, we try to deal with what's used in the province, but we also look to see, is there anything new and exciting happening around the world that we could bring that technology into Saskatchewan and potentially apply it. And so we deal, give some examples of specifications for mixes that are used in the province. 
just to give you an example of what somebody else might be using or so that you can compare your products to those. A lot of the materials are locally produced that are used in Saskatchewan and a lot of the jurisdictions have their own formula, their own mixed design and so on they use. But there are also a lot of proprietary products out there that you can buy that are specially made for certain things. And a lot of them come in barrels and so on that you can keep in your shop and use in the winter time for emergency type repairs. And so we do try to include not an extensive list but a description of some of those type of materials so that people know they're out there. Similarly with equipment, you could write numerous books on the equipment that's available for pothole patching, how to use it, all those type of things. So what we tried to do was touch on the equipment that's available, provide enough information that people would understand the processes, but not to get too detailed that it overloaded the report in terms of content on it. And that's both looking at what are the jurisdictions using, and also what proprietary equipment's out there, or what might be available that isn't being used in the province. Next area we started getting into was the whole area of best practices. And there's a little section on preventative maintenance. And this is your typical pavement performance curve. And, whoops. And you, everybody's seen these. What we're talking about is this little area in your curve where if you go out there and do a permanent repair on a pothole, it's actually preventative maintenance because it prevents that work having to, or whole section having to be redone or the potholes growing and things like that. So we try to link where it fits into your whole pavement management system. So the best practices what we talk about is things like drainage. How do you maintain the surface drainage? Keep the water out of the structure. Things like your subsurface drainage. A little bit on the design of, you know, how, how should the pavement be designed with proper drainage in it. One other thing we touch on is things that could be done to try and reduce potholes in the spring. Something as simple as cleaning out the snow in areas before it melts so it doesn't sit there and soak in in the spring. And I think it was Yorkton has a program where they do that in critical areas just to try to get that snow out of the way so it doesn't sit there and melt and, and impact the roads. The other areas is early identification. Used to be that uh, you'd have crews go out and look for it. Now with all the new Twitters and emails and cell phones and so on, every time a motorist hits a pothole, they can phone. And there's probably ways of very effectively uh, collecting that information or having pothole hotlines or whatever where you can get the information that it's there early, maybe get it fixed temporarily so it doesn't grow and become a big, big concern. And that's maybe a very important issue to, to the... I'll call them politicians or whatever, but the, the people that are running the organizations. And there are new technology, mobile detection systems, things like that, that potentially you could have mounted on buses or whatever that identify early stages of these things, give you that advance warning so you can identify early in the process and treat it before it gets big. Best materials available, rule of thumb is always use the best material available, but that not necessarily is always practical and so on. We try to deal with some of the specs, some of the local mixes, identify what could be used in certain circumstances, and also what testing can be done on that material to see whether it's suitable for use. In this area, we also get into the proprietary mixes, 
uh, assessment processes, and we touch on this potential of having databases or something set up provincially where you share that knowledge of who uses what materials, what, who's done trials. And that's where I get back to this uh, previous role that the ministry and so on had. They used to do a lot of that work and share it with people. If they're not doing it, they're not working with the university to do it. C of T is stepping up and taking that role, but it's going to have to keep going so that that information is captured and shared so everybody doesn't have to keep reinventing the wheel. So the biggest issue typically working with pothole repairs is you're trying to use a material that's supposed to be placed hot and you're trying to place it in adverse, freezing, cold, wet conditions. And so there, we talk with, about some of the issues that can be done and how to deal with the actual process of fixing a pothole, some good practices in terms of how to clean it out, blow it out, dry it out, and also things that you can do about using hot boxes, storing material inside, all those type of things are touched on in the report. So you're dealing with the issues of winter, so it's that emergency type situation where you're trying to carry traffic through temporary repairs until you can get it into the season where you can actually go out there and do either semi-permanent or permanent repairs of those failures. And a lot of cases that's the challenge is through that spring breakup period when all your potholes are showing up. It's usually the cold and wet season where it's difficult to do the repairs. So under temporary repairs, we talk about five different methods. Under permanent repairs, we talk about non-structural and structural type failures and how you deal with them, how they're different. We also include a sort of a flow chart, and this isn't very uh, specific, but it's more put in that to give people an idea that you can actually lay the processes out that meet your own situation and use it as a communication tool with your own staff, with the administrators, maybe with the counselors and so on, so everybody understands the process. And you can build your own to, to suit your own needs. So we included one just as an example. So here's the, the methods we looked at. The first one, throw and roll. Throw and go, throw and roll, we combine together. Typically, just fill the hole with whatever you've got and roll the truck tires over it. That's probably the most common use and probably the shortest lasting. The graph here shows the durability, the different types of patching, spray patching, edge sealing, semi-permanent spray injection, and what you can expect for how long they're going to last. Similar type thing, we talk about how long they're going to last. Your throw and roll may last three to six months. If you're lucky, it may hold permanently. But in general, your temporary repairs can last three, to, three months to a couple of years if you put some effort into them. And then your permanent repairs, depending on if they're structural or non-structural, are 5 to 15 type year repairs. And we tried to pull some costs together related from the sponsors and their information. Finding costs is very difficult, but we did give a range of costs just so that, again, the, the people uninformed people that are reading it had an idea. Like your throw and roll is typically 30 to 25 to $30 a pothole. Spray patching with the seal, edge seal is probably anywhere between 30 and 60. Your semi-permanent repairs, things like spray injection, depending on your equipment, your materials can have an extremely wide range, anywhere from 20 to $125 for a small pothole. 
And then we didn't look at permanent repairs because again, that depends a lot on your process, what you're doing. We gave some uh, information related to the training requirements. And as we saw it, there's sort of that three levels of training that you need related to pothole development, pothole repair, pothole management. There's that high level planning that's the, the planners, the people that are designing the roadways, the people that are designing the pavements, as well as the councillors, the politicians, the people that are doing the budgeting, things like that. They have to understand where it fits in your, your pavement maintenance, your pavement management system. There's then the maintenance authorities who are the, the people des deciding what the work is, what equipment they're going to have, all those type of things. And then there's the frontline workers. And the frontline workers, it helps a lot if they can identify what's the cause of the failure, what type of pavement is it, what's the appropriate repair, so that they can maybe modify the procedures a little bit and get better performance. Future work, we just put a few up here. The Economic Union is in the process of completing a report on durable pothole repairs. We were trying to get a copy of their draft or whatever, but we're unable to get it in time to put the, it in the references. And other things that are happening, CAT is now doing a, a study on trench reinstatement. So that'll fit in with pothole repairs because a lot of the potholes show up at utility cuts and things like that. So that's sort of the range of information that's available on future work research. And again, we, we highlight the issue of the advantage of this interagency sharing of information. And if there's a process that you can share the information you're using, we captured some at one point in time if you had something that was ongoing that allowed you to feed that in and also check with what the other cities in the province are using, things like that. And then we talk again about some of the work that could be done with the emerging technologies, whether there was any use in collaboratively working together to do things like phone applications for pothole reporting or vehicle mounted pothole detection devices, all those type of things. And then some of the new information out there on things like pervious pavements and so on, whether it be useful trying them in the province, doing a demonstration, if there are advantages to it. When you look at the materials area, there's the whole new warm mix technology. Warm mixes are designed to put out on, at lower temperatures and still have that workability compaction. Maybe there's a potential to, to use that technology with your winter patching material preparation and gets a product that's more workable, performs better in that situation. We couldn't find any information on it, but it's something that maybe there's some research should be done on that area. And the whole issue of wrap, the recycled mat or reclaimed material, and presentation later is on use as a wrap. Wrap is a good pothole filler, especially for deep structural type potholes. And that's the short presentation, trying to keep it non-technical. Our main discussion around the table of the ours was uh, one thing that I guess would be useful would be uh, uh, the best kind of training video for this app. But again, that would have to be somehow customized to the particular city circumstances that it was required. Uh, the other thing was that I know it's touched on in the report, but then not in a lot of detail, is uh, the communication aspect of. Uh, Obviously, 
you know, he did exactly what we asked him to do, and if this stuff wasn't in there, we didn't respond to it. So, uh, anyway, well, we, we did identify that you know it wouldn't be that difficult to put together for any of these parts. Right. I know Mike was had a kind of a specific thing he oh, was looking yeah. for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's, 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 it's a good report. I know people pay a lot of dividends. I know one thing we uh, maybe will promote this, and I was just curious to meet with the authors. Is uh, one of the drivers of the was to try, try see if we can uh, from a different proprietary products or something different all of them. There's no with a uh, the one I think when I originally referred to it, it's something like a SAS gun. Some SAS mix. Something that like either a cold mix or a whole bunch of specs that maybe batch with a specific type of proprietary asphalt or whatever that would work for municipalities in Saskatchewan or particular other direction. Uh, I was my third book, the, uh, you know, the most great muddy marsh. When you've got that brown, the streets are brown and wet, and you're trying to fight this thing, something is. That would make the middle of the season, yeah, you could use it if you wanted, but if you have hot mix, fine. But to really something that we could all be, we all pitch in, everybody would batch a couple hundred ton, and PA takes a third of ton, and you take 50 ton, and then we work in our thing. So maybe that's the next step for you. Know, it's, I've never been really able to get an answer. The answer I always get is, oh yeah, well, we'll just batch, we'll just batch this stuff before, and it's good enough to buy the bags. That's what I think how we do it. There we bought. We bought a load from people from Winnipeg a couple years ago, because uh, they had a thing on TV called get their cold mix stuck or something like that. Or else, we were just such good climbers and we ran out. That was the only place that had any. No, I, it, so, did you get, did, did you get any of the other comments back in the stuff that you found on them? I don't think there's anything. Like the, the specs of patching materials used in the summer and so on are probably very similar, but. I don't think we found anything that uh, people used in the real cold weather and so on. Some of the proprietary products that come in barrels and so on are extremely good, but they're also extremely expensive and it's a same very area. specialized applications. Like this easy, now this, this one here that everybody uses, the easy street gold asphalt, is that heat mix or is that just asphalt uh, proprietary asphalt oil which you blend using your mix? It's a complete mix. Oh, it's a complete mix, okay. And does it, you see, so you have to buy it in bags and stuff, you can batch it yourself? Yes, they produce it in Saskatchewan. It's a gas. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 there's one item in Calgary, too, that I don't think we included in the report where they actually heat their aggregate and can create right. mix in the wintertime. They've got a process to heat yeah. the aggregate. And they we're actually we're look at the uh, training for hot boxes with cold mix. Like I say, that's where we're dying, you know. And, we get I'm scared of this spring because we had just had a second one that's here in a hundred years as us in the Yeah, I don't know all the details, but uh, they developed they were developed a process for a recycled mix to reheat the rocks before they put it into the plant. And then somebody started saying, Well, why couldn't we use that process to heat it in the winter time sure. to use it for one? So there, there may be things like that that are available. There was actually a manufacturer of some equipment. Someone offered said uh, it's a trailer set unit that actually recycles uh, chunks of wrap yeah. into a hot mix. And, so, and they, that's what Calgary is actually using, they refer to Calgary, where they then they keep it hot, put it in the hot boxes. Yeah. So they, in essence, patch and uh, patch all winter of the hot material. We have one, we just sort of would batch, quickly batch uh, uh, five gallons of ale and then you heat up in 10 minutes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's on a it's a total yeah, line of board. Yeah. What were those guys having around? How many times have they been there? They have three of these. It's three and a half times, seven and a half. And we just tested uh, today at our yard. Uh, using all the channels and bottles that came as a leftover from some jobs, you know, like water time or something like that. And it was about the same as what they were doing before. So they had Almost looking like they were the hot mix because there was some contamination, some garbage mixed with it in the air, so it wasn't a purpose hot mix. But uh, if you do it carefully or screen the feet, you can keep you know, up to half a meter or half a meter. 
times and they were in trouble. It would be 10 minutes much for that traffic. And there are 150k a year at those? It's 150 for uh, uh, 700, uh, or 200, total on 200 for 10 tons, and about 80 something for 3 tons. You know, that's uh, probably it's not very feasible, but in the comparison, the cost to the operator there is high above that. And then produce a few times per hour. That's assuming the moisture level is uh, low level. The more moisture the production goes down to three times per hour. So it won't be cost effective. Land and Harbor they don't have any contacts with that company, their website, etc. is not in that way. But that's a, the type of area where there's a potential. If you took that equipment, but had a, a good mix that you produce in the fall that's easily accessed, and put it in and used it for your warm winter batter, hot oil batter, that's the type of research that maybe needs to be done. And, and you could use the equipment then in wintertime for fixing pot oils in the summertime for other things and make it useful to spend that amount of money on it. That's a Canadian company from Vancouver. They, they built them in Germany, but they are imported. Uh, Blend, what where's the chair table for our discussion? I guess the, the primary response here was that uh, we're very pleased to see what they're doing is uh, confirmed by this report. Uh, the issue of prevention is always high in their minds, and uh, someone raised the question of uh, under. under under drainage, you know, the pipes on the bottom roof as a measure for controlling moisture that would otherwise not be bottom of the pipe. And secondly, uh, and this is probably the, one of the next projects, back sealing and slurry sealing. Well, definitely, that's, we looked at identifying the causes of the failures uh, and understanding your pavement pipes. And so, preventative maintenance of spot sealing, strip sealing along your joints, and so on, where you typically get the potholes developing is to prevent the potholes from occurring in the spring. The drainage system, definitely, it, if it's part of the original plan when you're building the new roads and so on, putting an under drain system in, or just a thick drainage layer, is not expensive. If you're trying to retrofit, it's extremely expensive. And also, if, if there's work being done and it destroys your drainage system, it's even worse. So it's tying that planning and understanding of the need to your pavement system with all the other utilities. And I think since Regina has gone to their deep granular materials and subdivisions and on main streets, your road performance has improved significantly. Um, I know you, you touched on the uh, public reporting uh, uh, notion and that was being discussed at uh, Table 5 in terms of uh, whether anybody's got a system for tracking incoming reports because of the concern being that you know, there's 10 people live on the same street, got the same pothole, but they all see it from four degrees different angle and they're all phoning it in kind of deal. So I don't know whether you guys have uncovered anyone who had anything in that, that way or not. Nothing uh, specific, it's just that, that was, those type of systems were being developed and the people were looking at the advantage of them. We're, uh, we're kind of scared in Saskatoon. There's mm -hmm. lots of apps. Right. The problem is we can, we can barely keep up with the ones we know about, and then the ones you know about that you don't fix, we end up being liable for them. Yes. And so it's a kind of a chicken and an egg thing. So I'm actually trying to keep them having a little bit of a lid on it until we get our capacity side dialed in because there's no need, no need going about 40,000 potholes when you can only fix 10 today. Yes, there are many apps in the world. Yeah, and, and that, that question I was more or less raised, what I was, was curious about was anyone in the communities if they have some method to use to track because as you touched on, but like I said, you have 40,000 reported potholes, but do you have 40,000 reported potholes or is it 20,000 that reported? Exposing 40, so we, we kind of lost that, uh, 
a balance of being able to know that we have one small hole for application, but there can be good competitive performance. Well, they can narrow that scope. I think that's the one advantage of actually developing a system where you know, maybe it's you use it on a texting in or whatever, but they actually fill in. It's on the block between the street or whatever, so it's identified and so on. Otherwise, you just get somebody says on such and such a street, and it could be ten blocks long. Right, but at the same time, I don't, I don't want to. Uh... 10 reports for the same bottle, or one person calling in 10 times for the same bottle because he but said, Watch out his front window. Yeah. We haven't been there since 9 30 when he called in. It's 9 45. I'm calling again at 10 15. Where are you? You're getting all these extra calls. But there are also systems that will allow you to pull that into a database yeah. and sort it yeah, and right. identify it. Well, that was exactly my point. Uh, the application that the uh, city of Detroit was using. Uh, Allows the GPS location, yeah. firstly, and secondly, it has that internal process where it actually lumps the reports together. So no, it's not quite as scary. And there's a free one, I think, you got from Winnipeg, developed one of these kind of little small chargers. It sells advertising on the side and wants you to use it, but it's that uses the, the GPS that you got on your phone. Right. So. Sure, I have seen at least one I've read about, uh, and I don't know how they manage it, where if I report it via the app, when it's fixed, I get a message that says that it's fixed. There's a sort of a little level of citizen satisfaction there. <laughs> uh, anything else? Floor is open. Well, while I got you, I, just, uh, I read, you know, the, the, I was trying to give you your explanation about cross oil, because I know I'm going to have a, little, or a bunch this year. I, I think I understand the mechanics of it, but just wonder if you had an intimate experience with cross foils that you could describe well, it to me. My experience, uh, my definition of a yeah. cross foil is where you have water concentrated, whether it comes from the top yeah. or the bottom, the frost goes out, and there's still a frozen layer below, and you've got that saturated, either free water or saturated material sitting on top of cell goes and that's where it could go out. Because they're just the, that was the ones that just. Yeah, just the whole material right I one, I didn't know if it was an ice lens that forms and then to melt it. So the key would be water over still, still the frost doesn't come out of the ground all the way, but you've got water. I have seen it on the highway system, I've seen it where when trucks go by, the water squirts through yeah, the grass, yeah. and can make it a squirt out of the side. I'm curious, as you're going through this exercise, have you found anything that uh, you know, our two municipalities were doing that should probably be more widespread or something? Because uh, I think you've looked at things outside of Saskatchewan and potentially the country, but there's something proprietary technology or something that needs to be brought here because it would be quite useful or think we'll... Uh, I don't think there's anything that jumped out that everybody uses throw and go and throw or throw and roll. Uh, it's some of the spray patching, those type of items that are seem to work fairly well. But again, the equipment is extremely expensive. So it's whether a small city or town can afford that type of equipment, whereas the bigger cities, yeah, they can justify maybe one or two of those pieces of equipment. But even the one or two pieces of those the equipment, they can't keep up with the volumes and rodents and failures they've got. So it's, it's still a balancing. So even if they've got the sophisticated equipment, they usually revert back to the throw and roll because that's something you can react quickly to. You can add crews, you can do things and so forth. It should be noted uh, again that uh, on the uh, USB that came with the reports are the appendices to the reports, and I think in this case it was quite extensive. Yeah, uh, appendices. I was going to note that if if you haven't looked at the report in detail, don't give it to your secretary and say print this because the file the references will be uh, <laughs> three hundred pages of appendices in this report. I think so. Be careful with the stick. <laughs> print the report, print the appendices, but not the references. <laughs> I was just curious to get that in the, if uh, I kind of hitting on the, Marlon mentioned about the, the train, or was that one thing, 
you know, we've got our old guys training, our new guys, whatever, but I was wondering in your exploration of different places, if you found one that maybe had the best basket of, maybe they already had little videos and training or things inside their, their city website or, or, or even some stuff to help with PR. Uh, this, these communication summaries may do some of that for okay. you. This uh, is uh, about uh, eight or ten pages right. summarizing everything that they came up with in uh, okay. total layman speak. Fair enough. So that may help. But I know I, I like Carlos' idea of you know we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm sure somebody's created a really good you know indoctrination video for a crew. We didn't find that. We found yeah. some manuals, some good yeah. manuals that are quite thick. Right. And if the crews had time to read them, they'd be worthwhile. We also talked to Alan about uh, developing training growth, like little training modules, as it wasn't part of the scope, because then it wouldn't be that difficult to have somebody do that or have us church as well. Or we could work with individual jurisdictions to do it or a group of them. That might be uh, another LIM project that some places are going forward for. Anything else for other LIM business? Or? Okay, cost was strong for different techniques. Was that one time cost or that was kind of life of the bottle or, or patch? I think it, we had trouble getting costs, but it, that's the one time cost of just doing yes. that repair on one product. Yeah, Elena, you're probably better. Yes, uh, the range provided on the screen was for a single part of average part for repair. However, the range was given for small volumes versus large volumes because we were speaking about, you know, uh, I guess, work, lumping the work together so that it fits more together because it costs less and so on. And also, bigger jurisdictions, they obviously can invest, can make capital investments. On a different scale, and so on, so the cost is. And the problem you get into is if you've got a crew that was doing throw and roll, you know how much the crew cost you for the day, but you don't necessarily know how many thought folks they killed, so people were guessing and saying, well, they on average do this, and here's what it costs. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much.